Good morning. It is good to see you all. You're looking very good. I welcome our Channel 5 audience. I've got a little reverb going here. I don't know who's running our sound, but uh, if you can help us, I'd appreciate that in that regard. We'll time him. Let's all sing, shall we? Dun, 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 dun. No, we won't do that. Take your time. We don't want anybody to have a cardiac arrest on the stairs there uh, in that regard. We're just glad you're here today. It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. You know, I was looking at some statistics from the Center for Disease Control. And listen, if you're between the age of 0 and 21, should you get COVID-19, you have a 99.998 percentage of overcoming it. In the worst case scenario, let's say you have three comorbidities or more. Now, that, that puts you in a nursing home, all right? And that puts you on hospice. Even in the worst case scenario, should you develop COVID-19, according to the Center for Disease Control, you have a 94 plus 94.990 chance of recovery. That's pretty darn good. Chances are you're going to die from your comorbidities, not from COVID-19. So the first thing we need to do is, without infecting anybody around you, exhale a little bit. We're all a little tense, especially when we learn the President of the United States and the First Lady have COVID. We're just a little bit worried about that. Well, we understand that real well. How that happened, there's always a reason. People who were not credentialed turned up at the Republican, Democrat, um, what do you call those things? Screaming at each other, interrupting each other. Debates, yeah. Interrupting the, the uh, formal interruptions, uh, informal interruptions that took place. And those people had COVID-19. And the largest, greatest hospital in the world didn't screen them before they had access to all of this stuff. So now they believe those people who were hired from different states to help set that up gave COVID-19 to those people who were there who, who developed COVID-19. So see, there's a reason for all of this. So again, exhale. But let me give you another one. Here's Paul. He's in prison. He's beaten. He's in Jerusalem. He's in the very cell Jesus was in. The 23rd chapter of the book of Acts, he's there and he's discouraged. You know what discourage means? It means to not have courage. And it says that Jesus came right beside him. Isn't that beautiful? Verse 11, Jesus stood right beside him. Jesus is standing right beside you. And he said to him, take courage. If courage were this bulletin this morning, Jesus is saying to us, Take courage. You're discouraged. Take courage. And we take Jesus' courage. And then Jesus said, you were faithful to me in Jerusalem to witness. You will now have your fondest... You know, on the bucket list of Paul was to go to Rome someday. He said, now you're going to go to Rome and you're going to witness for me. I'm going to give you exactly what your ministry was all about. Your dream of ministry is now going to be fulfilled. Take my courage and take my blessing. 
And that's over every one of us here today. God's going to see us through. His purposes are not going to be thwarted. He's bigger than that. All right? If your God's too small, let Him grow. Put a little water on Him today. Let Him grow. We serve a mighty God. And we thank Him for that today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we take courage. We pray for the President of the United States. We're always told to pray for the President of the United States and our leaders and our First Lady who have been diagnosed with COVID. We and other churches around this nation are all praying this morning for their well-being and their good health. We pray that you would protect the former Vice President as well from COVID. We pray that you would be with senators and congressmen and all of our leaders and bless them this morning with good health. And God, help this nation to turn the corner on our issue of this pandemic and bring courage into this room right now that we can just reach out and grab from you that allows us in this time not to be discouraged as the people of God. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Let's stand together. Number 29, begin my tongue some heavenly theme. In the call to worship. Jesus commanded, love one another. We come to worship the God who is love, that we may learn to love one another. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Jesus said, no longer do I call you servants, now I call you my friends. We come to worship the God whose friends we are through Christ. Let us sing praise to God and live in love and friendship toward all our family. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Loving, Loving God, God, thank, thank you, you for, for the, the family, family of Christ, Christ into which you have placed me and the loving fellowship that we enjoy together. As we study your word and seek to encourage each other in our gathering, I pray that the word of Christ would dwell in us richly. Lord, 
I know that one day I will stand before you and I long to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. I pray that in the days that I have ahead, I would draw close to you and to my brothers and sisters in Christ as together we await that glorious day when we stand in your presence face to face with you. In Jesus' name, amen. And now the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. come to the time in the service where we have prayers and praises. And first of all, I want to uh, remind you that the flowers on the altar were given by Barb Hartzell in memory of Bill Hartzell's birthday, which is the 6th of October, and in honor of Sue Smith's birthday, and I'm not sure what day that is, but yesterday? Okay, which was yesterday. So, uh, and we want to continue to pray for Sue as she rehabs from her surgery. And um, I talked with her this week and she's doing well. She's just, it's just going to take some time. So do we have any other uh, praises or prayer requests? Courtney. Norm, Norma Sullenberger. For Brad and for health concerns for Brad. Okay, then we will have the hymn of preparation in this very room.
grief counselor, I know that the truth of the matter is that grief and bereavement come when something you once held is no longer in your hands. It's gone. It's a very simple concept. When you love something or someone and you don't have that anymore, you have very real a sense of loss in your life. Um, if you've been married 40 or 50 years and you lose your spouse, you forget who you were before you knew your spouse. You always identify yourself as being, you know, Crystal's husband, um, in my case. And I identify myself from our relationship with each other. So it's a loss of relationship. Uh, I tell you all of that because we are in a place right now where we, the church, need to lead the world. We have lost a lot of things because of COVID, because of the COVID pandemic. What's different between us and the rest of the world? You ready for this? This is really great. What's different from us and the rest of the world is that they have lost something and they have gained nothing. Where we have lost something, we gain more and more and more of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm with you always. And so today we thank Him for the fact that we grieve not as those who have no hope. See where that Scripture comes in? Because we have Jesus. And so let's take a few moments and maybe you haven't talked to Him this week. I'm not scolding you. I'm just saying maybe you need to take a second before you hear my voice and just say, hey God, hello, I know you remember me. I love you. Thanks for being there. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank You that we have You. The old song we used to sing in the church, let me see, Jesus only. Jesus only. Jesus only. Let me see, Jesus only. Only He can satisfy. The enemy wanted to shut down churches across this nation due to COVID. Because the enemy knew that if he disconnected God's people from the body of Jesus Christ, from brothers and sisters who would encourage them when they were discouraged, even from you, then it would decimate those of the Christian faith. And they would be lost in this pandemic. But greater is He that is in us than he that is in this world. And with God, all things are possible, Scripture says. And so we believe, Lord God, that You are able to do exceedingly beyond what we could even imagine or ask for in our lives according to the teachings You have given us in Scripture. Come stand beside us. And let us this day take Your courage. And may we offer to others Your courage as well in these times. Thank You, Lord, for teaching us to pray in this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You've been faithful in supporting your church. Those of you watching by television, I believe you've been faithful in supporting your church. Remember your congregation. 
Remember your pastor in your prayers and remember your church in your giving. Uh, our ushers are not going to wait upon us today. The offering plate is out in the narthex. We hope you'll visit it. You'll find uh, my check and Crystal's check there. And uh, hope we'll find yours with God's people as well. Let's worship the Lord through the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
We ask, O oh God, that you would bless these gifts today, utilize them for the furthering of the gospel, and prepare our minds to think, our ears to hear, our eyes to see, and our souls to understand, as your word is rightly divided before us this very day. For it's in Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to ask you a very heavy philosophical question. Are you ready for that? As you're all seated today. How do you spell gray? Now don't, don't blurt it out. Don't say it right now. Just think about it in your mind. And uh, how do you spell the color gray? Um, actually, it is one of the chromatic colors, gray. I looked it up. It's a combination of white and black gives you gray. My pants today are gray. How would you spell gray? How many of you would spell it G-R-A-Y? Would you raise your hands? Okay, good. How many would spell it G-R-E-Y? Would you be bold enough to raise your hands? Yeah, absolutely. The truth of the matter, both is, are right. Both are correct. Um, and the reason I learned this little exercise is that I was taught in medical school from a Indian doctor, from an Indian professor. And Indian people, people who were taught the English system, your Earl Grey T, it is spelled G-R-E-Y. And in the United States, we spell it G-R-A-Y. And I was preaching in Kenya, and I spelled it G-R-E-Y, and everybody nodded their head in there. Everybody loved me because Kenya was started by Great Britain, and they know that's the true way to spell it. But in fact, the reality is there's two ways to spell the, the, it. And sometimes when I write letters or I write uh, sermons or things like that, my notes, uh, I go back and forth. Sometimes I spell it G-R-E-Y, sometimes I spell it G-R-A-Y, and now you're confused for the rest of your life. Amen? <laughs> now you don't know how to spell that blessed word. All right, you just won't know how to do it. Well, the point of the matter that is that when we come to the 14th chapter of Romans, the spelling of the word gray is exactly what we're talking about. There are many things in the life of the church that are just clear as clear can be. The word says in Matthew 5.48, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. What's the goal for our holiness? To be perfect in Jesus Christ. We have that, a word for that. It's called sanctification. And that is God's cleansing work in our life to make us each day more and more like Jesus. Those are facts. There are lifestyle issues about sin. There are lists of sin in the Bible that says, this is sin, don't do it. Can't enter the kingdom of God if you're involved with this kind of sin in your life. Clear as can be. Some things are absolutely black and white. I like things black and white. Amen? I hate gray. I hate gray. Now you understand the illustration. All right. I hate gray. Gray are those things that are widely varying opinions regarding spiritual issues that are not clearly defined in Scripture. Let me read the text and then we'll talk just a little bit about this before morning communion. Now accept the one who is weak in faith. Now an interesting thing about this little phrase, weak in faith, there are only two kinds of people in the church. There are those who are weak in faith and those that are strong in faith. And every one of us in this room right now think we know the right way to spell gray, and we know we're the strong one in faith, not the weak one in faith. Isn't that interesting? You did not think of yourself when it says that we needed to uh, accept the one who's weak in faith. We said, oh, that's not talking about me because I'm strong in faith. That's talk oh yeah, the person next to me, that's who it's talking about. Uh, that's my spouse, weak in faith. Oh yeah, that's, there's my wife there. I can see that. It's plain as day. It almost has her name written right in there. All right? But in reality is, some of us in this room are weak in faith. And some of us in this room are strong in faith. And some of us know how to spell gray, and some of us are totally confused. All right? Reality. Except the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his or her opinions. 
One has faith, they can eat all things. But he who is weak eats vegetables only. Let him not who eats regard with contempt to those who do not eat. And let him let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or fails. And stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. <clears throat> Excuse me. Each man will be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord. He who eats does it for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. In other words, both of them are praying to God whether they eat or don't eat certain things. For not one of us lives for himself, not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, wherever we live or die, we are the Lord's. For this, to this end, Christ died and lived again, and he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. Why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written... As I live, the Lord says, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue will confess praise to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Now on the way to church today, you passed many a denomination. Different groups. Why is that group two streets over, worshiping separate from us here today? Why is the church across the street from them different? Why is one that's over here on the corner here. Why, why do we have so many churches that we have to pass before we get to this church? And the answer is very easy. We're right and they're wrong. Now that's what a lot of Christians believe. I come to St. Paul's Church because they're right and you know, all the rest of my past are wrong in some fashion or another. Now you laughed at that, but that's the truth. You know, it's funny how truth can be sometimes. And so the enemy of our souls has taken those different opinions and he has separated the church for the intent of weakening the church's witness to the world. And unfortunately, it's like having a shiny little object that's just thrown in front of our eyes and we're told to look at the watch, look at the watch. You and I just watch the shiny little object as the devil holds us in front of us and we separate ourselves from other members of the body of Christ, on issues that are gray matters in the life of the church. Now, there are three of them that were then. You know, these issues that are the Bible's either silent on or it doesn't give a clear principle on, there were three of them Paul mentions in this text. One is the diet. You know, you came from Judaism. Do we eat ham? Or do we not eat ham? Do I buy more expensive meat at the meat market? Or do I go behind the temple of this false god and buy the meat that's been sacrificed that's much cheaper? It's half price. I know where Crystal would be. She'd be behind the false uh, uh, cult worship place buying cheap meat. That's, some of you would be there right in line too. Well, does that make you a weak Christian? Does that make you a strong Christian? Does that make you a right Christian? Does that make you a wrong Christian? So there were issues of diet. The second were days. Do we worship on Saturday? That's the old Sabbath. Seventh-day Adventist churches are all meeting. Not today. They met yesterday. They're going to heaven. They're our brothers and sisters in Christ. And they follow the Old Testament dietary laws. If you're ever in a Seventh-day Adventist hospital, never eat in the cafeteria. The food is horrible. It's all soy burgers. I always made sure in Nashville that I went first to the Seventh-day Adventist Hospital. Then I went to Vanderbilt. That's where the heart unit was. And they filled it full of cholesterol. They were looking for future customers. And I always ate in their cafeteria when I had to do hospital calls down in Nashville. <clears throat> now, that's the truth. That's the God's honest truth. Isn't it funny how the truth is sometimes? You know, what day should we worship on? Saturday or Sunday? Sunday's the day Jesus arose. So the church worships, for the most part, on Saturday. How about drink? Should I totally, totally abstain from alcohol? 
Or can I drink with moderation? The church I was at previously when I hired the staff, yes, and in my churches previous to this, I hired the staff. Nothing wrong, you hired a great staff. Uh, and that's wonderful that that worked out. You hired a great staff, but I was able to hire staff. And one of the first questions out of my mouth was, how do you use alcohol? Moderation? Do you abstain? Because I knew what was going to happen the first time they saw my new minister of music out drinking beer with these tacos at that church that I was last at. They were going to call me on the phone and said, Psh, we got an alcoholic for a minister of music. He had two beers. I watched, I watched him drink them both. It took four sips on the first one, three on the second one. Okay, I'd get the phone calls. Because these are issues that are not real clear in the Word of God. What in the world do we do? What do we not do on these kinds of issues? Now, we don't have issues of diet per se nowadays, and we really don't fuss over drink and, and, and on days of worship in St. Paul's Church. But we do have some makeup. When my mother grew up, she wasn't allowed to cut her hair and she wasn't allowed to wear makeup. And, and I remember very clearly preaching in a, in a church and, and um, uh, when, when the issue of makeup came up, the pastor leaned over and said, see that Jezebel on the fourth row, third person over? And he called her a Jezebel because she was wearing makeup. My feeling is if the bar needs painted, paint it. Amen. Thank you. I got an amen from the barns. No, I'm not going to get an amen from the barns. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. All right. So, you know, what do we do about makeup? Dancing. You know, can a Christian dance? Playing cards. I didn't know this church got offended by playing cards in the fellowship hall. And one day I, we had a euchre tournament and I found out I offended some people because I played euchre. Thank God they didn't know I played poker and I made over $700. No, 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 just, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. All right. See, you needed to laugh a little bit today, all right? Just a little bit. Going to movies. My mother and father's first dates to go to a drive-in to see movies could not be told to my grandfather because my grandfather didn't believe in going to movies if you were a Christian. Was he wrong? Was he right? Went out to eat at a restaurant the other day. Family showed up on their tractor. Great people. I've eaten with them. You want a good meal, you go over to that church over there just before Covington on a Sunday after church, and they put a spread out. Whew. If I weren't married, I'd ask three or four of those old ladies to marry me. Hey, they're just great, great cooks. And the beautiful thing about it is you can hear your arteries hardening as you're eating your pie. It's just great stuff. Are they right and we're wrong because they won't use an automobile? Are they more holy than us? Are we more holy? Are we less holy? What in the world? How do we make these decisions today? Using electricity. Um, uh, we went over to Holmes County and, and we, had, we spent a weekend there and that's all I can spend. God have mercy. No radio, no television, no life. And uh, I went over there and they explained in the Yoder farm, if you've taken the tour of the Yoder farm, you go upstairs to the teenage daughter's bedroom and they show this blanket over top of this mirror. And he pulls it off and he said, this is something we don't show the other church people. Our daughter was going to get married you know, they're, they're reenacting how that lifestyle is. It says our daughter, a teenage daughter was going to get married at 13, and the only way we could keep her on the farm was to buy her a mirror. And the church frowned on the mirror, but she would stand in front of it all day long. You know, didn't do any work because she's in front of the mirror. You know, is that unholy? Is that ungodly? If you go to Holmes County, you can't stop and take pictures of Amish farmers. Amish farmers believe their soul is stolen when you take a picture of them. So never take one. That's taboo. Well, how do we know on all these issues? Well, let's give some solution. What do we do when people don't know how to spell the word gray? Like we do. Amen? Number one, accept them. Look at the second word in your text. Now, accept. Accept them. 
Well, why in the world do we accept them? Because look at verse 3. God has accepted them. Do you see that? When people have a different opinion on these great issues in the life of the church, don't split and become first St. Paul's and second St. Paul's and third St. Paul's church or first Baptist, second Baptist, third Baptist. Okay? Don't, don't go splitting on these issues and that's how a lot of denominational splits have occurred on gray issues. Instead, accept them. I spell gray differently than you. Accept me. Why? Because God has accepted me. And you do things and think things different than me on certain issues. What do I do? I accept you. You've heard me say from this pulpit, I do not drink alcohol. I do not. Why do I do that? Because I've buried a lot of teenagers who have died in car accidents from alcohol. And I don't want to ever think that their pastor gave them permission by my lifestyle to do something they weren't mature enough to handle. That's it. Do I preach from this pulpit? If you're drinking wine, you're going to hell. You're going to hell, you probably are a Jezebel with makeup on too. You know, you don't hear that from me from this pulpit. These are gray areas. God has accepted you, and I'm to accept you. And God has accepted me, and you're to accept me on these gray areas. Number one, accept each other. Number two, don't label people. Don't label people. When you are judgmental, when you are name calling, little punk, that prude, okay? It's human nature when you disagree with somebody to name call. Don't label them. There's only two things we're allowed to call them in the Bible weak in faith or strong in faith. That's it. That's it. If God told you it's okay to drink in moderation, who am I to label you when I overeat? When I'm overweight? Whoa. Now you went from preaching to meddling, Pastor. All right? Isn't it interesting that it's so easy for us for an issue that's not a problem with me to judge other people on that issue? We had a friend, Crystal and I did, he was a pastor, and he lost, how much weight did he lose? 80 pounds? 100 pounds? And, and he was a good friend of ours for years. And so he called us up one Sunday, we were visiting his church, and he called us up, and Crystal and I are standing there, and he said, this is a great man of God, one of the best preachers I ever heard. I don't know if he really said that or not, but we're going to pretend he did. And, uh, and then he's, he said, even though he's overweight, And I thought, dude, when you were a fat squirrel, I didn't say anything about you when you visited my church. But it's, so, it's human nature to judge other people. God says, don't label them. Don't label them. Number two, don't judge them. Don't put them down. Don't snicker at them. Don't make fun of them. Don't look down on them. Don't discount them. Look at verse 3 with me, would you please? Let him who eats regard with... Let him not... Who eats, regard with contempt with who who does not eat. Let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. Don't judge each other. Why do we judge? You ready for this? Why do we judge? Here's why we judge. Real easy. When I'm judging you, I'm no longer paying attention to my own faults. And to be honest with you, it makes me feel a little better when I see that there's some things you're missing in your life spiritually. I feel pretty darn good about myself. Well, at least I'm not Bob. You got two of them you can choose of in the sanctuary right here who I was speaking of. I won't say which one's the weak brother and which one's the strong brother. I won't say that. At least I'm better than Bob. Or, or, or at least my walk is closer to God than Michael's back there. Or... Or, you know, I, it makes us feel a little better. I call it the Appalachian Shuffle. We don't move on the ladder of life. We don't get any higher 
in life, all we do is to grab the leg of the person on the ladder above us and try to pull them off. The idea is to move upward closer to God, not yank people off the ladder. Amen? Amen? Okay, all right. Just make sure some of you had to wake up. Number three, do not try to change people, wives. How many times have I been in counseling a couple, getting ready to marry, and I'll say to him, does she have any faults? Oh, very few, Pastor. I can live with them. She's, she's just a doll. I swear to God, this is the truth. I wouldn't say it except it's true. Then I turned to him and I said, does he have any faults? She goes, oh, don't get me started. Oh, don't get me started, Pastor. But I'm going to change him. I'm going to change him. And then I have to say to the lady, remember when I hand you the ring up in front of everybody on the platform, it goes on his finger, not in his nose. All right? Now, there are men who try to change their wives. I know that's true too. Uh, but I'm, tell I'm telling you, there are a lot of people who think in marriage, one spouse can change another spouse. You are not given permission by God to change people who are different than you. What happened when Crystal and I got married? Opposites attract. I do things the correct way. Honest to God, the first argument we had when we were married was how to put the toilet paper on the roll. Does it unroll from underneath? Does it come off the roll from above? Can I see the hands? How many above? All to Jesus I surrender. How many believe it comes underneath where it goes straight down the wall in a straight line? Now you're all going to check it out, aren't you, this afternoon? <laughs> there she goes. I told you. I told you. Don't try to change people. Nagging is not an indoor sport. Look what it says in verse 4. The weak brother, the weak sister, stands or falls before Jesus. But Jesus, if that person falls, will stand him back up. Isn't that beautiful? Let Jesus tell somebody they're spelling gray wrong. Let Jesus tell somebody they're drinking too much. Let Jesus police that. I, I'll never forget as long as I live, I had a lady, I swear to God, she had, I think she had a yardstick. I think she really did. She brought to church every week for, her, for herself. And this lady would go around and, and after service was over, remind, remember, we have three worship services. You got 700 people in each service, or there about 600 in each service. And so people are pouring in, pouring out. I'm shaking their hand. After I get done shaking hands after the third service, every Sunday I had to put my hand in ice water because I would literally swell, my hand would swell from all the handshaking that I did back before COVID-19. And this lady would come up after third service, I'm dog tired, and she'd say, did you see that lady that was sitting in the middle section three rows back, how short her skirt was? No, I didn't. I've made a covenant with my eyes like Job where I just look at a woman in the face. If you change glasses, if you change hairstyle, I can, be, I can tell you for your husband does. I do it many times. You've seen that, haven't you here? I like your new glasses. Oh, Pastor. I like your new hairdo. Oh, Pastor. Thank you. I like the new color you've chosen. Oh, thank you, Pastor. I made a covenant with my eyes. I didn't notice that girl's skirt. I'll check out next Sunday. But... <laughs> just for the principle of being a good leader. There are so many people who go around with their yardsticks and we're miserable in the life of the body of Christ because we're measuring things we don't need to measure. We're judging people it hasn't been given our permission to judge. We're trying to change people. You're not going to change anyway. My ruts are so deep they're not going to change. Pastor goes to a church and says, well, we don't like what he does here. He jokes too much or he's too serious or whatever he is. I mean, I could go on any issue right now and I could find different opinions as I shake your hands. That was the worst sermon you ever preached. That was the best sermon you ever preached. I'll remember your jokes. 
Where's that late, young lady live that had the short dress? I mean, I'll hear all kinds of opinions as I shake hands at the end of this day. But the church is not about opinions. It's about the black and white that we know from God's Word in our lives. Let's prepare our hearts for communion.
Those are the things that we believe. Those are the things we hold on to. Ye that do truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God. She's got to take me a little further here. I'm using a prompter. Kind of like a candidate who has to have a prompter. And walking from henceforth in His holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God. And you respond with these words, please, as you read them. Almighty and most merciful Father, let's stand. We have erred and strayed from Thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against Thy holy laws, but Thou, O Lord, have mercy on us. Spare Thou those, O God, who confess their sins. Restore Thou those who are penitent, and grant, O most merciful Father, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of Thy holy name. Amen. On the night in which He is betrayed, our Lord took bread, and having broken it, he said, This is my body, broken for you. Take, eat of it in remembrance of me. And then our Lord took a common cup, and having blessed it, he said, This is my blood, shed for you on Calvary. Take, drink of it in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we believe in the statements we just sang a moment ago, the big things. With clarity, we put our eyes on that which is black and white, and we live lives of mercy and grace for the things that are gray. For it's in Christ's name we pray these things, amen. into your closet and when you walk into your closet are your clothes facing this direction 
Or are your clothes facing that direction? The, that direction? This direction? I don't know. I solved it in our home. I said, dear, it bothers you very much which way the toilet paper is. So it's by the grace of God I now empower you to change every role in our home as long as we are married. And that's the way it is. And God can work that out. Let's settle on those big things for Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank You this morning for the opportunity to be in this house to study Your Word. Thank You, Lord. We laugh sometimes at it. It's humorous at times. How sometimes we can become very judgmental and legalistic. May we, O oh God, major in the majors and not major in the minors. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.